everyone and welcome to this special episode of Rebooting. We have an amazing guest today and someone who I've looked up to most of my cyber career, to be honest. She puts out a load of amazing content on YouTube and Twitter. Um, so hello, welcome Shannon. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for coming. And your background and the purple, I just love. It's just awesome. Oh, thanks. I should have turned on my Halloween decorations. I have a few light up things back there, but <laughs> they're off for the time being. <laughs> so one of the questions I always ask all my guests when they first come on is, how would your family describe what you did for a living? Well, I would say that luckily YouTube is so popular now and it's so it's a household name. It's a lot easier for me to describe what I do. And it's a lot easier for my family to explain it to their friends as well. So um, it's kind of normalized these days. So whenever my family, like my mom is trying to explain it to one of her friends, one of her retiree friends that she hangs out with, uh, she usually just says, I, Shannon makes videos on YouTube about how to secure your laptop and your iPhone from hackers. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That makes you sound awesome, actually, though. I think lots of people will think that was just that was just the coolest job ever. <laughs> it's definitely cool. I mean, there's a reason why I've been doing this for like 12 years, and it's because I love it. Like, I would not do anything else if I if I could trade this job for something that paid a lot better. I probably still wouldn't trade it because I have such a passion for educating and entertaining and YouTube allows me to do that. So I just, I, it's a dream job for me and it brings me happiness every single day that I'm able to do it. That's all you want from life, really. Agreed. That's perfect. <laughs> so obviously one of the things that I think you're really well known for and have been extremely successful in is building a brand. And I think we're going to get into a little bit more about why we need brands in cybersecurity and as individuals in cybersecurity as well. But just so our listeners and, and viewers can kind of understand what, what would you, how would you describe a brand and, and what is its main sort of purpose and function? Well, when you look at traditional branding, uh, you can look at any company and think about what defines that company. How do you recognize that company based on a logo or colors or the kind of, videos that they put out online or what kind of um, advertising that they do for different industries. Uh, and you can take a lot of what traditional companies and traditional brands have done online and turn that aspect into a personal brand, uh, which is something that I have been touting for a very long time to the cybersecurity and infosec industry as something that you really need to focus on. Um, I believe that having a personal brand enables you to do a lot of things and get a lot of opportunities that you may not have had if nobody knows that you are available and that you know what you know, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So if, if you're putting yourself out there and you're giving some transparency to your online persona, it gives other people uh, a, a lot of much easier ways to get in contact with you and potentially bring you those opportunities. So since cybersecurity is so very particular about anonymity and making sure that you're not putting your real life online. Yeah. I'm kind of trying to combat that a little bit and explain that you need to put a little bit of yourself out there so that you do get these opportunities and you're able to have some career growth just using free platforms that are available to us right now. So how do we balance that? Because it's, it is difficult, right? Because the whole time, my whole career in cybersecurity, I've been saying, lock down your social media, don't put any information out there that about yourself. And then now I find myself posting things about my life, things about my career, what I'm doing quite openly. And it's, it feels almost hypocritical in some ways at some points. So how do you yeah. sort of balance that? I um, I definitely sometimes feel the same way, especially if I'm posting something about like my my home life and I'm taking pictures inside my household. I don't necessarily want to share my address online, but I'm more than happy to share pictures just of day to day, you know, goings on around the house. Uh, so you really have to approach 
what you're putting online uh, based on what you want to be transparent about. So what is your approach to transparency online is the first question that I always recommend that cybersecurity professionals kind of focus on. What are the things that you're comfortable sharing with a mass audience? Because if you do put it online, it's there. And it doesn't matter if you're using some kind of private platform to post it, somebody can easily screenshot it. So I, that's that's something that everybody should know, but a lot of people just, you know, we sacrifice uh, some security and privacy for that convenience. Um, what kind of personal brand do you want to portray online is another very important factor as well. If you choose to go at it like, I'm going to be 100% anonymous and nobody's going to know anything about me, not my real name, not my address, not I'm not even going to have an email address that's public. Like yeah. then that's going to be very very hard to build a personal brand around because nobody's going to know who you really are. So if you give people some kind of personality online, like you are Lisa, you're a great example because like I love the 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 photos that you share on Twitter of your hikes and the interesting places that you go. Like it looks beautiful and now I want to travel more <laughs> because of your pictures. <laughs> so that's a great example of how you're showing me that you have this this personality, this adventurous personality and that's something I would never have known about you had you been 100% anonymous. So kind of focusing on what kind of transparency you really want to share with everyone is extremely important and how you want to approach the information that you share as well. So is that the starting point then? If someone's watching this and they're thinking, okay, I wanna start building my brand as a cybersecurity professional, is the first step to think, what do I want that to look like? Is that, is that how you started? Well, for me, it was a little bit haphazard, which um, I will go into a bit more detail about because as I was growing my career, that's when social media platforms started to exist. So I didn't get to delve into it after everything was already started up and maintained. I kind of just started new accounts wherever I could, whenever a new thing was posted, and it was very haphazard. But um, whenever you do start to develop your personal brand, I highly recommend that you choose your platforms because managing a brand online is also a part of your job and you don't want it to be something that just takes over your time 24 seven. We still want to have a real life that we can share online like your hikes. So if you are focusing way too many, much on way too many platforms, then it's going to be unmanageable and you may end up having things slip uh, against your performance. So if you are not focusing down, kind of niching down to whatever specific audiences you really want to focus on, uh, then it could get a little bit confusing and it could take over your life and be a little stressful. So I highly recommend choosing platforms and choosing what you want to be known for. Now, one thing that a lot of people don't know about me is I like to extreme coupon. <laughs> And I'm also obsessed with Sailor Moon. Now, I've gotten a lot more public about my obsession with Sailor Moon, but I don't really talk about extreme couponing online because that's not a part of my personal brand. I don't really want it to be because it doesn't matter that much. But the Sailor Moon part kind of does because I like talking about the merchandise online and I've built a YouTube audience around that. So kind of focusing and niching down on platforms, on what you want to be known for and what you really want to promote about yourself online and writing out a plan of action for yourself physically in a, in, in a, in a real life space or a real life scenario, whether that's on paper or in a notepad app or what have you, before you start approaching it online can really save you some work in the long term. So do you think, because I've looked, obviously your Twitter is amazing. I literally worship your Twitter account. It's just so beautiful. <laughs> it really is though, like the purple and then you've got the outline and everything just looks so consistent and beautiful and well thought out. And mine's kind of just like a collage of stuff. Um, <laughs> and so is that kind of important as well, looking at the consistency of your posts as you build that brand and kind of things from colors all the way through to language that you use and terms that you yes. use? and. And do you need to start that from the beginning, do you think? I'm actually glad you mentioned that because changing direction while you're building your brand online uh, 
all, all of a sudden can really throw people off and they may end up unfollowing you if, if follower accounts ma matter to you or if you're building some kind of subscription service like through an email platform, if you want to build an email newsletter database, then automatically just all of a sudden changing direction can really, really throw people off and make them not want to be a part of your audience again because they don't, they may not uh, have any kind of comparison with you that they can make. Like if they felt like you could be a friend of theirs, they may not feel that anymore. They may not feel that connection. So it's important to kind of stick to your plan throughout the entirety of your personal brand and also make sure that you don't take that haphazard approach. And I mentioned that previously and I would love to go into a little bit more detail. Um, when I started building my own personal brand, I kind of realized uh, back when Twitter was first started up and when Facebook was first announced back in the day, when I was first starting on YouTube, I was like, oh, I should probably get profiles on all these different social media platforms because people can find my YouTube channel through those social media platforms. Good idea. I didn't realize at the time, maybe my sign up username should be the same on all of them. And it is not like my YouTube channel is youtube.com slash Shannon Morris, but my Twitter is twitter.com slash snubs. So I'm still known for both names, but it would make way more sense. And it would be very, very concise and easy for people to find me if all of the usernames were searchable under the same scenario under each and every single platform, but they're not. So in, in a sense, I kind of wish that at the time I had realized how important personal brands were, uh, but I didn't. So now I just kind of have to deal with it and hope that I can get the same names on whatever future platforms there may be. So I, that's something that you definitely need to consider. And um, as well as not, if, if you don't live by your own vision statement, like if you, and we talk about vision statements in companies all the time, but for a personality, for a brand that you wanna post online about yourself, if you're trying to build your own career, if, if you're not living by your own vision statement, then the fakeness will definitely come out online because you can't live by that you can't live by a fake reality 100% of the time. Eventually something will slip up. So if you're not bringing some kind of transparency, some kind of honesty online, then people will figure that out and they, they won't feel any kind of connection with you in that sense as well uh, if, if there is some kind of fakeness there. So Right, and I think there's, there's, there's some people um, who come across as insincere maybe, come across yes. as um this is the best shiniest version of themselves and i know we all you know we don't post our deepest darkest moments on social media right. said, you know it's not consistent with the brand it's you know no one wants to hear that you're sitting on the floor crying because there's no ice cream or something That's just, <laughs> um i mean <laughs> i would cry if there wasn't any ice cream right i mean it's, <laughs> like, everyone would sympathize with that but um yeah so i know we have that but there's there's this element i think like you said where if you're not genuine you're not going to be able to carry that on and that was something I right. was quite mindful of that you know I'm a bit of a joker to be honest I like a bit of a laugh so I post photos of cows for literally no reason and people find it really funny <laughs> Um, I love it. <laughs> but, you know, and it, with the hiking and stuff. So if you can, can maintain that, and I think that's one thing you do really well, which, to be honest, I sort of looked at you as an example when I was setting up my Twitter. And I was thinking, actually, that there is this level of, you know, it doesn't look so artificial and so polished that it's it's all constructed deliberately for this, even if it is, you know, you don't you don't get that impression. So that's quite important. Yes. I think a great example of this is Instagram, just kind of in general. If you look at travel photos, they're always so clean and so beautiful and pristine, and they make every part of this world look gorgeous. But if you actually travel to these places, you realize that oftentimes people have been photoshopped out because they're tourist destinations or fences or signage has been photoshopped out. Or maybe they took the picture in the middle of the night, even though the park is closed after sun sunset. So there's always kind of caveats to these online realities, which aren't really realistic. So you really have to bring kind of a vulnerability online or, or people won't realize that you're an actual human being and they may not feel that connection with you anymore. 
Yeah, no, I totally agree. And so when you see people building brands online, have you seen sort of common mistakes or, or trip ups that have happened that you think, oh, you know, that was a bad move? And what are those sort of common mistakes that people actually make? Well, I think the biggest mistake that I have seen from people who who want to build a personal brand is they they don't start doing it. Uh, I think when when you think of building a personal brand online, especially in InfoSec and cybersecurity, uh, it can seem like a daunting task. So a lot of people put it off and put it off and put it off to the point where eventually you can't build your brand anymore because and this is a great quote that one of my YouTube content creating uh, expert friends has, has mentioned in many of his talks. He has said, if you don't control and manage your own brand online, somebody else will do it for you. And if you don't focus on building your own personal brand and do it, do it now, because it is a very important part of building careers now in this in the year 2020 and going forward, uh, then somebody else will do it for you, especially if you are somebody who is going to networking events, going to conferences, giving speaking talks, or maybe you're running classes, or you, you have a podcast. If you are not building that brand and developing it online on you know different platforms, then somebody else may create fake profiles for you, or they may, may start sending out information about you that just not is necessarily true. And that's a really, really major issue that I see with a lot of folks, even in the YouTube industry with like tech creators. A lot of them are like, oh, I'm not on Twitter because I just don't care. And I'm like, well, you should get on Twitter and at least get your username, at least, you know, post your YouTube videos because you're not taking advantage of one, an audience, but also you need to make sure that that's reserved for you because if it's not somebody else could take advantage of that missing component on a platform and take it over and pretend to be you and that could i never could thought often, of that yeah i'm gonna it, literally it go on and start reputation. doing that later <laughs> it, it can definitely hurt your reputation but it also it makes you lose some of that credibility when people can't find you online and instead they find some kind of fake resource Right. And I think the other thing that I see personally, like people say to me, oh, you've grown quite a lot of followers. I mean, obviously nowhere near what you've done, but I'm still quite proud of it. Um, and they say, you how do you be. do it? And I would say such a lot of hard work and perseverance, because if you think you're going to post one or two times a month and then suddenly you're going to get 10, 20,000 followers, it's not going to happen. Oh, yeah. No. <laughs> There's no way that would happen. I mean, it took... So it took Hack5, I believe, five years for us to actually make it a full-time job. And when that became a full-time job, it didn't really take over the income and make me feel comfortable until like two years after that. So I wasn't really at a comfortable position until probably 2012. And I had started in 2008. The show actually started in 2005. So it takes a very long time to build an audience, to build a brand, to build a reputation where people are coming to you as opposed to somebody else for the information that they are trying to find. And when you find that niche audience or when you find the, the network that you really, really wanna get into, uh, then you can really start taking off. But it does take time. And for us, it took years. It doesn't necessarily take everybody several years. Some people do go viral immediately because they've caught on to a very specific niche at the perfect timing. That does happen, but for most people it does not. And I believe that having that reality and understanding that that is a reality is extremely important, especially when it comes to online. There's only so many hours in a day that somebody can read tweets, check Instagram, follow people on YouTube and watch their videos. So if you're not giving them the best of what you can give, and if you're not connecting with them on a personal level, then they're not going to subscribe to you or they aren't going to watch your content or check out your photos on Instagram. They will definitely subscribe to somebody else over you if given the opportunity. Another great quote from my friend is, uh, you don't have to be first in whatever genre you may be going into, but you should be the best. And it does take a lot of time to actually be the best at something. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you've also, so Graham, my friend Graham clearly, he said to me that he runs a podcast and he said to me that the thing that matters most to him over everything else, over sponsorship, over anything else is his listeners. 
And if his listeners aren't happy, yes. then it's not working. End of story. And I think absolutely that's how you've got to be, isn't it? And I'm sure you're like that with your videos, that if you're not putting content out that's satisfying your viewers, then it doesn't matter about sponsorship. It doesn't matter what nice lights you have or how many followers you have. You know, that's irrelevant because you're not putting out content that they want to see. So that's one of the reasons why it's so important to kind of figure out what your niche is and what you want to stick with because if you get bored with it and then your audience gets bored with it then where are you going to go from there so with my experience of building this brand around youtube and doing hack five and doing shows for threatwire and then building my own youtube channel it's always been there's a core component to each and every one of those shows in its security and privacy because i have this extreme passion for making consumers and making people that are the most vulnerable more secure and more private online so that they can understand what they're doing online my goal in life is for the entirety of consumerism to be secure and private online, which is never going to happen. So I'm always going to have an audience, <laughs> but <laughs> that, that would be amazing to me because it means I could retire. <laughs> but you've, that's an amazing goal to keep you on track with reminding you what's important and sort of linked into this. Cause I know you do um, reviews, you do unboxings, you do other things where you work with big brands as well. And one of the questions that I've always personally had is how as a security professional, do you feel you're able to resolve working for a brand and then potentially endorsing a product that may be insecure six, eight, a year down the line? Yeah. So that's a great question. Um, I've actually run into that with a previous sponsor and I won't name names, but I did <laughs> name them on Twitter. Um, basically read your contracts very closely to make sure that you are allowed to speak your mind and speak your own personal professional opinion on a topic, especially if you're working with a sponsor. And that's something that I always make sure to check for. Uh, but also nobody can tell the future and everybody is vulnerable. So <laughs> while I don't take sponsors on Threatwire because there is no, there's, there's no guarantee that a company will suddenly get hacked or not get hacked in the next week when I might have them sponsoring a show. So I just don't take sponsors on that show because it's very newsworthy, that show is. Um, I will take sponsors on my, my consumer product reviews and my security and privacy videos uh, because that does help me fund the show, but also because if they do get hacked down the line in the future, uh, there is nothing keeping me from providing a disclaimer to my audience and saying, hey, these people did sponsor me in the past, but now this hack has happened and I'll talk about how they fixed it or how they remediated it with the process afterwards. I think that's always important because, um, you know, companies can only do so much. There are always new vulnerabilities being found. There are always new, you know, zero days being posted. So it's important to take Take what I say with a grain of salt, I will say, but, you know, give them a little bit of credit. Give their their InfoSec professionals that are working at these companies some credit because they're doing what they can to remediate the process, too. So anytime there is something that happens like that, I always try to make sure to include information about how they're fixing it so that consumers are secure. And do you if you get a request from a company who says, I'd really like to sponsor an episode, um, do you do some due diligence into who they are and what the brand is and, and sort of think, well, you know, you're a brand new VPM and company, maybe I won't endorse you right at this second or something. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've, I've never taken a, I have never taken a sponsorship with a VPN and there's a reason for that. And it's because um, most of them have issues and there are issues that I don't agree with just on a policy level, or it may be because they keep logs or maybe they only allow you to pay with a credit card as opposed to paying with Bitcoin or something like that. So they aren't 100% anonymous. They aren't going to be 100% secure. So I can't, moralistically, it's really hard for me to take a sponsor from a VPN and be like, yeah, I can definitely support this company because who knows? Um, when it comes to consumer brands, 
I'll, t I'll give them a little bit more leeway. Um, I do always ask brands if they've had any vulnerabilities mm -hmm. and I also search vulnerabilities because there's news articles plenty <laughs> about previous bonds, previous breaches, previous leaks of data from every single brand mm -hmm. on the entire in the entire world. Uh, so I always make sure to check for those. And I also always ask them, especially if they're like a security company, if they've done any kind of third party audits or if they've worked with any kind of penetration testers, how do they make sure that they are staying up to date with um, you know, securing their consumers, the people that I am going to be promoting their product to? So yes, absolutely, 100%. I always make sure to do some research. Um so if you get it wrong, if you if you mess up your Twitter brand or your Facebook brand, you really mess it up and you get it completely wrong, how easy is it to remake yourself? So, you know, if we look at sort of even the politics that are going on in America at the moment, trying to rebrand different yeah. politicians and go, look, new and shiny and much better version is here. How hard is that? It's definitely hard and it's a process that I'm actually currently going through. Um, I'm trying to rebrand myself not as you know the girl from Hack5 who does hacker videos, but as somebody who consumers can go to to find educational information about security and privacy, but also information about new tech that's up and coming that they may be interested in. And it's definitely a process. Um, I've found that luckily, given that I've been doing this for so long, it's really hard to separate myself from any personal feelings that I might get if somebody, you know, tweets out and says like, oh, Shannon's not a hacker anymore. And, you know, I don't take it personally any, anymore because I'm like, no, I'm, I'm rebranding. I'm currently through that process. So it makes sense they would feel that way. Um, but I still try to incorporate some of the, that kind of traditional hacker-esque type of content that I used to make all the time on Hack5 into my new channel so people still are getting the kind of content that helped my channel grow in the first place. So it's, it's definitely a process, it's hard. And I think the biggest thing from there is that you have to separate some of your personal feelings um, from what you are trying to incorporate into your career. So if, if you go into it, too heavily, like emotionally, then it will definitely stress you out to change your direction in the middle of it or to change your personal brand or especially if something negative had happened in your life. Uh, one thing that I have found is to own it if something bad goes wrong. Um, before I had started with Hack5, some really bad stuff happened and it went public and a lot of people posted about it, but I went public about it too. And I wrote a blog and I was talking about how, you know, the pressure of being a YouTuber and how it affects you, not just on my scale, but how it affects you if you don't have, you know, friends and family that can really be there for you and be a support system. So I think owning it and just pulling yourself away emotionally a little bit, not closing yourself off entirely, but just keeping some of those emotions, you know, with your friends and family, the people that are closest to you and with that support system that you have can definitely help um, keep the stress levels very low if you are going through that process. Because I think a lot of the viewers who have spoken to me have said that they really want to start a blog or a podcast, but they're just too afraid yeah that they're going to get criticism, they're going to say something wrong and they're going to, you know, and, and that suppresses their, I guess, their creative, um, their creative side to make content, which is a real shame for everybody in the community. So how do they kind of overcome that fear, do you think? I think that's a, that, gosh, that sounds like a fear that every single content creator has ever had, <laughs> including myself. Um, I mean, yeah. my, my big process was overcoming my fear of editing, really. <laughs> There was yeah. a big, big, that was a big process. And part of it was going online and taking the time to educate myself and to, so that I did feel more self-confident and building that self-confidence absolutely helped me kind of get out of my shell and start experimenting with editing. I know I'm talking about editing, but really this can, this can be used for just building out your personal brand from the get-go, building that self-confidence having a support group, like I had mentioned, and definitely taking your time to understand what your niche is going to be and understand what kind of 
influence you want to have online can really, really help you kind of delve into the online personal branding in general, but also kind of stay true to yourself and have that strength that you really need to go into a wider audience because not everybody is going to like you. That's a major, major issue that you will run into online. Everybody does. Not everybody is going to like you, whether it's just a simple thing about what you look like. I have plenty of those myself. Or if it's how you speak, or maybe it's just the topics that you choose to cover or the information that you choose to be known for. There are going to be people that disagree with you and understanding that sooner rather than later will help you combat those issues when you do face them. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And that sort of leads me on to my final question, which is a horrible question, so I do apologize. Do you think that generally we're spending way too much time on social media and as you and I are content creators and, and use social media, are we sort of part of the problem? Uh, yes, yes and yes. <laughs> uh, there have been a few times where I have had to take a break from Twitter. Um, for example, uh, you probably know Mythbus Mythbusters. Uh, Grant E. Mahara, he passed away over the summer and me and him were really good friends, uh, very close friends. And when he passed away, I didn't realize at the time that my Twitter, because my, my Twitter is full of nerds and geeks, everybody would be tweeting about this. And it was heartbreaking to see it all day for like 24 hours. So I had to take a break from Twitter because it was just affecting me on a much deeper scale than what I thought it would. So I just turned it off completely and I had to step away because there was, I, I couldn't deal with it. It was just way too much to deal with right after his passing and it hurt. It was heartbreaking. So taking a step from social media, I can speak from experience, uh, is extremely important. And even though I am a content creator as you are as well, it's still very important just not only for us, but also for our audiences. Too much social media, getting all your news from social media and getting all your content from content creators on social media, it can affect you, especially if you aren't like, you know, going outside with your significant other or doing things with your family and friends or doing things that originally brought you a lot of, a lot of happiness before social media even became a thing. If you're not doing that, then it's going to affect you health-wise if you're just sitting around, you know, checking out your smartphone all day on a physical scale, but also men mentally as well. So it is something that I try to do every single day. I take my dog on a walk and I don't check my phone for the whole hour that I'm out with her. And I also like to spend time with my husband after work. Like when five o'clock hits, both of us get off work and we we watch our favorite Netflix show together and we eat dinner together every single night. And that's something that we always try to do. So taking those breaks doesn't have to be, you know, two days or a week's worth, but you know, hours, hours here and there, it can definitely help. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Where can people go to follow you and watch your YouTube content and just immerse themselves in your wonderful world? Uh, I will give you two of my favorite places, twitter.com slash snubs, S-N-U-B-S, not two Bs, just one B, and youtube.com slash Shannon Morse, just like my name. Um, you can go to the YouTube channel to check out all of the tech content that I'm making, much of which is having to do with security and privacy. And my Twitter, which is where I basically tweet about Sailor Moon, Halloween, um, Starbucks, and security and privacy. <laughs> I saw the Starbucks tweet today, it made me giggle. I liked it. Um, and all the links from everything we've discussed in the show will be in the description below. And don't forget to like and subscribe. Thank you very much for tuning in everyone.